Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Happy Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to 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 Children's Environmental Health Day. Healthy kids and healthy places. 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 Healthy kids and then healthy places. Welcome to Hold on, not yet. Ready? Go. Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Welcome to Children's Environment Health Day. <laughs> Ready, go. Welcome to Children's Health Day. You want to say, Welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day? No. Uh, what do I say again? You can say, welcome, welcome to Children's Environmental Health Day. Like welcome to Children's Environment Health Day. Children's, children's, children's environmental and health day. Healthy. Healthy kids, healthy earth, plants. <laughs> places. Healthy places. Healthy kids and happy places. I don't know. Healthy. Healthy kids and happy places. Healthy <laughs> kids and healthy places. Healthy kids and healthy places. <laughs> All right, can folks see the slide that I'm sharing? Terrific. Hi hey everybody, thank you for either uh, sticking with us or if you're just joining, welcome to our Children's Environmental Health Day 2020 celebration. I'm Perry Sheffield. I'm a pediatrician at Mount Sinai uh, and deputy director, co-lead of the New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers Network along with Dr. Maida Galvez. Um, we have a network of centers across New York State in Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Albany, Westchester, uh, the Sinai-based center here at, uh, in New York City and in Long Island. Um, so our team uh, really works from the premise that fundamental health changes will depend on supporting and learning from the communities themselves. And we wanted to use this uh, next uh, short time uh, to explore how interested audience members uh, can, um, can be that source of change from their respective stakeholder positions, whether or not that's community-based organizations as an elected official, educator, uh, health provider, or something else. And so I want to um, uh, introduce and reintroduce our, um, our invited guests for this next segment. Uh, as some of you heard, Dr. Aparna Bol, uh, she's the medical director of uh, community integration at uh, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Case Western in Cleveland at Case Western in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and to echo what Lauren Zajac said in her Grand Rounds introduction, uh, she's an amazing source of inspiration and hope. And as those, those of you know, who just heard her, her talk um, on climate solutions for child and health equity. Um, Uday Tambar is a vice president of community health at Northwell Health. Uh, he's representing the healthcare administration perspective for us in this session, and I'm specifically excited uh, to meet him virtually. Hi, Day, and excited to hear from him um, since he coordinates Northwell's involvement in their regional health anchor network work. And that's something that uh, Aparna mentioned in the last hour, and I'm hoping that we'll learn a bit more about what a health anchor network is. So we are thrilled to have both Aparna and Uday with us for this discussion. Um, I wanted to kick off uh, asking Uday first if uh, you could um, spotlight a local issue for us in Long Island, um, something that you deem relevant to this conversation and um, hopefully something that will highlight Northwell's role in building resilient communities.
today. Are you, let me see if I can unmute you. Yep. There you go. Perfect. Yep. I think now we can hear you. Yeah. Perfect. So great. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation to participate and a pleasure to meet you and Dr. Bull and everyone else virtually as well. Um, so I think I have about five minutes. So I'm going to do, you know, touch upon a few things and then hopefully we can talk a little bit more. Uh, first is talk so about some takeaways from COVID. And I hope this isn't redundant with what Dr. Bull spoke on earlier, um, sort of COVID's impact on children in New York State. And then talk about sort of the response that Northwell's been through Democratic Collaborative's Healthcare Anchor Network. Uh, so, you know, a couple of takeaways from COVID, uh, which again might to this group might be obvious, is that one is it, it's not the great equalizer. There have clearly been disparities by wealth and by race. Uh, you know, poor communities and communities of color have been impacted more. We've seen the death um, uh, much higher in those communities. The second sort of takeaway, and this is a phrase coined by the current uh, New York City um, Commissioner for Health and public hygiene is that health equity is not a sideshow during COVID, it's the main event. And we've seen that in times of crisis that those living on the margins are most likely to be harmed. Um, in uh, New York City, you know, Queens bore sort of the initial brunt of the first wave of the COVID. And part of the reason was that many of the residents in Queens include low income <clears throat> and immigrant families who live in multi-generation multi -generation homes, which are very crowded social distancing is not an option. So they've been, and also have a greater burden of the underlying conditions like diabetes. And so we saw a greater impact there. And so health equity has really been highlighted a lot. And it's been, you see a lot of that in the press as well. And, and we've been seeing, I mean, I think we've known this and I think, again, I think people on this call would know this is that seeing a great impact on children and there was a study that came out last week by the United Hospital Fund that really tried to quantify some of this impact. And there were you know, two sort of main themes in that study. One was that the, there's been an impact of children who have lost a parent or caregiver uh, due to COVID. And in New York, that's been about 4,200 children. It's about one in 1,000 child, uh, children in New York State that have lost a parent or a caregiver. But again, you see that the impact is greater in certain communities. About 60% of those children live in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Queens. Uh, when you look at the rate in terms of uh, Hispanic children, it's one in 700 in uh, New York have lost a parent as opposed to the general population, one in 1,000. And then for the Black and African American, it's been one in 600. And again, so we've been seeing sort of this greater impact. And again, I think you know this, once you lose a parent, or a caregiver, you're more likely, you know, greater risk of entering uh, foster or kinship care where we know long-term outcomes are not great, possibly prolonged uh, financial hardship, uh, long-term mental health implications as well. And in addition to losing parents, what's happened is a lot of the parents of uh, the children have been economically impacted as well. So you've had a new sort of group of children in poverty or near poverty. So we've seen greater risk of evictions from home, uh, greater in food insecurity and malnutrition. I think Dr. Bull was talking about a program addressing food insecurity before, loss of health insurance. And I think as we were transitioning in this call, we were talking about, um, you know, maybe go do your Zoom class with your child, you know, in between your five minute break, but a lot of low income families, there's challenges with remote schooling, right? You might not have access to a device. You might not have access to internet connection. We've also seen sort of direct health impacts as well. There's a lot of um, special needs students who access health services in schools and remote schooling does not allow them to access these important services. There's challenges with childcare as well. Uh, you know, if you're poor, some, you don't have the luxury of maybe working from home. And if primary schools are closed, you've lost your childcare as well. You know, the long term sort of impact we've seen in terms of the adverse childhood experiences. There's also a sharp potential loss of income due to the sort of learning def def deficiencies that are going to be there to the hybrid remote learning. So, part of this right response you can think about is um, we can do initiatives and programs, and part of it is more systemic and structural. 
And I think Dr. Bull had ended by saying, you know, the or, or, you know, systems part of the Democracy Collaborative's health anchor network, and so is Northfall Health. And so the healthcare anchor network, it's a system led collaborative of about 50, 52 different health systems around the country, which tries to improve community health and well being by leveraging the assets of the sort of health systems. And that includes hiring, purchasing, and investing for, for equitable local community uh, economic impact. The way I sort of describe it, sort of the thumbnail way, is like, you know, without social equity, there's no health equity. And usually in most communities, uh, hospitals and health systems are the 800 pound gorillas. So how you, how you hire, how you purchase, how you invest can transform the economic well-being of communities. And if you can improve their economy, you can definitely improve their health. So in response to not only just sort of COVID, but also over the, you know, over the summer, there was the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives sorry, Matter Movement. About 40 of the systems across 45 different states committed to addressing the racism and public health disparities and issued sort of a statement that racism is a public health crisis. And I, I can include the link in the chat for uh, you to see. And that was sort of saying, using our collective voice to say that, look, this is larger, right? Than just one or two projects we're gonna do. There's something structural that needs to be addressed and we're committed to doing it. And that sort of, that systemic racism poses a threat to the, the patients, their families and the communities that we're trying to serve. And, and this was a big thing, trying to get all these different groups to agree on sort of the language and wordsmith it. But again, I think it was saying across the country that as healthcare, we can't shy away from issues of racism and structural racism as well. We wanna improve the health uh, of our patients and those communities. And so I think the health anchor has been a great vehicle to sort of convene and sort of connect different kindred spirits of health systems and sort of create these sort of new initiatives to have a greater impact. So I'll leave it there and we can, you know, someone else will speak, but we can open it for questions as well. Thank you. Um, Aparna, do you wanna just give a, a highlight of something local? I, I know you, you gave so much in the last hour, but sort yeah. of as you feel is relevant to this. Yeah, I'm happy to. One thing I'll say, you know, I think sort of this idea of when we started our, before the Healthcare Anchor Net Network had a name and we were doing our greater university circle work in Cleveland, I know there are some who weren't with us in the last hour. So I'll just say briefly that um, when, when we convened a, a network of so-called anchor institutions on the east side of Cleveland that included University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve University, and the city of Cleveland. Um, it was at a time where we all had a lot of building and expansion projects um, planned. There was, there were, there was uh, collectively, we had some enormous amount, something like $1.5 billion of building and expansion planned. And so when the Cleveland Co Foundation convened us, we were challenged to say, how can we leverage those that spending the building the hiring to build wealth in our communities and so initially so what i there are a few learnings that came from that that i'm gonna just mention in in describing uh the the dave's supermarket example that i had referenced in the last hour um so we we spent a lot of time in those years sort of defining metrics around you know goals for local hires and we you know we we have this really cool program called step up to uh that came out of that that um actually works with a local um group called towards employment that um provides sort of uh workplace or workforce development and job placement for um individuals with employment risks in cleveland um, who may have barriers to employment and um, so we really kind of transform the way we do hiring to work with towards employment to actually go out into greater university circle neighborhoods and, um, and try to recruit local workers and then create a pipeline for promotion. We have like pathways to PCA and these other programs that, so that's just one example, but it was very, I felt like it was very process oriented, like how many hires from the community, how many dollars do we spend in these various categories in our local communities? Um, how many housing incentives did we provide as a collection of anchor institutions for either home improvement or um, rental or housing purchasing in Greater University Circle? So it was good, but it was also very 
like it was it was very process oriented and like that connection with what what are the what are we really trying to accomplish like what are the health outcomes we're trying to accomplish um I, we kind of grappled with that and kind of it was very process oriented the whole time so what i really appreciated about but but i but i feel like i learned a lot about the process because in that anchor institution initiative we, we really set the table for making decisions with um, everyday people and residents of neighborhoods at the same table as a, as a lot of the decision makers from organizations. We get a very power sharing kind of a model and making decisions about um, some of these big issues like hiring and building and, um, and, and other kinds of things. And so taking sort of that ethos of shared decision making and power sharing into this experience of planning our new practice, our Rainbow Center for Women and Children, um, I think sort of like allowed that lens to come into a, a space that was more about like health, the healthcare mission. It wasn't just, you know, not, I don't wanna say just operations, but it was like very intersectional about like, what are we trying to accomplish clinically? And what are we trying to accomplish in the way that we operate? And how do we do that in a way that shares power and decision-making with patients, families, and everyday people in the community, instead of sort of like a room of just, you know, CEO types from, from our organizations. And so having our community advisory board with that ethos, that anchor institution kind of ethos informing the programming of our center and the building of our center and how we want to now pivot to leverage this, this investment into inclusive investment elsewhere in Midtown has been really, um, I think, a great learning experience. And I think it's also been a way for us, to, it's complicated to talk about the intersection between environment and urban planning and environmental justice and health equity, it sounds really complicated, but I think having this platform that has um, this really great representation, this like kind of model of power sharing, it's been, we've built trust over years. Like, I think we really feel comfortable operating in that relatively complex intersectional space. So we're thinking about air quality, walkability, you know, mixed income, dismantling housing discrimination, you know, health outcomes, health care delivery, like all kind of together. And so one really interesting outcome um, that I'll just use as an example. So access to healthy food. We, we So our, our community advisory board like has self-defined, like what are the, the main issues related to community health we should address together. One um, problem that we wanted to solve was related to access to healthy food. We all know that just kind of like plunking a food outlet in the middle of a so-called food desert, like that actually doesn't work all that well. Like what does it mean for us to have better access to healthy food? So. I'll just use the Dave Sirk supermarket example as one that I think was a really cool outcome of the community advisory boards work together. As I mentioned in the last hour, this is a new supermarket that the decision to invest in building a new supermarket right near our new center for women and children happened shortly after we committed. And so I, I don't think it's unrelated. Like this is the idea of using our investment as a catalyst for other healthy investment in the neighborhood. Um, Dave's is a, is a great urban supermarket chain. Um, they were really open to working with our community advisory board to figure out how can the supermarket be accessible to the neighborhood where it is? How can it, um, how can it like sort of serve our mission to improve nutrition education as well, both in, from a healthcare perspective, but also a number of community organizations were interested in that. And so we were able to get some of our small community organizations, grassroots like health activists, community health activists, and um, patients and families in a room with the people planning that supermarket. And one of our um, one of our community advisory board members made a remark to me, like, you know, the fact that you as this large organization convene this meeting, like, I don't know how I would get an audience with these decision makers if you didn't convene convene this group and invite us to the table. So that to me is one example of the power we can have as a healthcare anchor. Like, if we invite if we set the table and then make sure that people that don't always have a voice are present and actually have a voice, that can be powerful in itself. So what ended up happening is this new supermarket is, um, is so it's, it's walkable, it's in a great location. It did, there didn't used to ever be a fresh food outlet in this neighborhood. It did, it did was accompanied by the closing of another market in what's called Asia Town, which is not too far um, from, from this new location, but we, we included people from Asia Town, and there's like a, a bus now for seniors from Asia Town to be able to come to this new market. So that was part of it. Um, wanting to have this community kitchen, we talked about we don't want to have like a culinary institute type kitchen. We wanted a place where families could go and feel like they're at their home um, kitchen to practice uh, cooking and recipes. 
people in the community wanted to use it for convening and gathering and cooking classes too. So we ended up with this supermarket that is well located, serves the needs of diverse communities, including this group in Asia Town that actually kind of felt like they were losing their local market. We have a community kitchen that our dietitians use several times a month for teaching free uh, cooking classes for patients and anyone else in the community who wants to come. Other groups in the community use it for gathering and for teaching. Um, and the and this new uh, supermarket has a great relationship too as a result with its neighbors. So it's one node, like to me, you know, this idea of creating a city that's walkable and inclusive, less dependent on car commuting, accessible amenities that are available to people of diverse incomes. Like one important node in that is a supermarket like this one. And we have it now like right across the street from our center. And I feel like our kind of leaning into being an anchor for the community helped it to be as successful as it is. We were just one, you know, it was a team effort, but it was, I, I, I'm proud of the fact that we played that role. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I, I practice in a city, so I think about urban planning a lot, urban planning and child health. And this to me is a really important sort of component of building the kind of sustainable and inclusive city environment that supports healthy kids. I will say the Health Caring Anchor Network does include more rural and non-urban health systems as well. So I just, I, I'm speaking from my lens being kind of in a downtown city. Thank you. Yeah. And I just had one, I think one thing I would just add to Dr. Bolz that I think it's an important point that she highlighted was that, you know, a lot of the work that's being done in this space is done through collaborations. And whether, you know, it's community-based organizations, community members directly, elected officials. And I think part of it is just acknowledging that we in healthcare don't have the answer on our own, right? When you look at some of the sort of the challenges that these communities are facing, even if they're sort of clinical issues, the solution is not just a clinical response, right? This is the whole sort of social determinants of health space. And I think it's important to realize that, right? If you're talking about, uh, you know, urban planning, you're talking about looking at the environment, you're talking about developing a supermarket, housing, affordable housing, all these are not sort of the sweet spot for sort of a healthcare delivery system, which is clinically oriented, right? It's saying that we need to holistically look at our patients and their communities and just have the humility to say that how to impact their health is sort of beyond our what our expertise. And I think that's very important right going down the journey. That it's not just within, it's not just what we directly do, but like I think Dr. Bull said, bringing people around the table, that's a very powerful, powerful ability, right? In these communities, we can convene the right actors, the right stakeholders. And then we can say, hey, let's sort of get together, let's think about that. But that's but that implicit in that is that we don't have the answer on our own, right? And I think that's just I think an important takeaway that people should have that to to move the needle on these issues at a patient level or a community level, we cannot do it alone. But we have the ability to bring the right players together, and to, if we do it in collaboration, that's how it's going to happen. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't you. want to take that away. No, that's a great point. And I, I know we have we only have you for a few more minutes. Um, and then we have another panel that we're getting to. But a question that came in from the audience and something we think about in environmental health. Um, we usually think about it chemically. We think about regrettable alternatives when we, but I think that the corollary here is sort of the unintended consequence potentially of uh, rent um, or property tax going up and dis unintentional displacement of longstanding communities or gentrification. I, I know, so to your point, we don't have all the answers, but do you, either of you have sort of lessons learned in um, proactively uh, thinking about that as we, as we try to um, make positive change in communities? Yeah, I could try. I can chime in there and then um, please feel free to add. Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question. That was sort of what I was trying to, um, to get across when I talked about um, being inclusive, mixed income and wealth building. So really like being explicit about, about, about the rising property, property values, benefiting the longtime residents of the community by sharing that wealth somehow. I, I can't, so that's actually in the work that we're doing with Midtown Cleveland, that's a big part of what we're trying to figure out. I probably can't share specifics yet because it's a little bit speculative, but how do we create some sort of shared equity for the people that already live in the neighborhood 
as land values go up so that rather than being displaced, their wealth is growing. That's one issue. And what kind of requirements can we make around mixed income housing? Thing collectively as a Midtown community. Uh, Midtown is really, I, I think I'm really proud of the fact that Midtown Cleveland, which is the CDC for this community development corporation for this neighborhood, has really specific equity goals built into the the their development plan so it's about so sharing wealth is a big part of it shared decision making is a big part of it requirements around mixed income is a big part of it and i will say too and filled its full disclosure i mean cleveland has a lot of empty space relative to some cities so we aren't we are we have the luxury a little bit in being proactive about requiring mixed income development like because the space isn't already filled like sometimes in i know that in more tightly developed cities you, you have this really unfortunate trade-off that is very hard to combat. We've seen it in a lot of cities. So we're trying in, in this project in Midtown Cleveland, we have a little bit of the luxury of empty space. Um, as, as we fill the space, how do we fill it? And, and it, makes, it, it, it requires us to actually set requirements. It can't be an accident. You have to, you have, to have a system in place for that wealth sharing to occur and a system in place for mixed income development to occur. And it has to be a rule. And that's, that's how we're approaching that issue. Thank you. Ujay, have a comment? Oh, you got muted. Hang on. Perfect. So I, I'm sorry, and I apologize. I have to leave to, for another uh, Zoom call. I, it's, by, it's not by coincidence that communities that have been historically redlined are the ones that have the worst uh, health outcomes, right? These are structural changes that need to occur, right? Communities that have been historically marginalized by policy decisions, right, are the ones that have the poor health outcomes that we're trying to address now. That didn't happen overnight and the is not gonna happen overnight as well. So when we talk about sort of the physical environment, we talk about planning, there's this sort of this tension, right, about nimbyism, about certain communities that have more political power are able to allow certain things not to occur in their sort of communities. We're talking about, let's say, if you want to play sort of a garbage processing center, a homeless shelter in the New York City sort of community versus other communities that might not have the same sort of political powers often have a disproportionate amount of certain, those type of services that more affluent communities don't want. We're talking about redlining, you're talking about policy changes, it's structural and that's why I'm saying some of it is like the work that we do as a system, right? And what are the initiatives we dive into? But we also need to step back and say some of this is structural. And how do we sort of use our bully pulpit to create some of those larger policy changes that took almost have been sort of cemented over multiple generations? And I think that's the challenge for us as a community, right? What are we gonna do? What's our stake in the game on those sort of broader, larger questions? that have been over multiple generations that have marginalized so many communities. And I think that's sort of where we are right now. And I think that's what's happened with COVID, Black Lives Movement, that we're here, right? And we, we have a choice. We're at a fork at a road as a sort of a community of sort of healthcare providers. Where, what are we gonna do? And I think the onus is on us to sort of take sort of that, ask those difficult questions and try to go down that harder path. Um, and I Thank apologize, I, I need to just go to this other call. Right. Thank you. And, and we're going to get transition to our next panel. Thank you so much, Aparna and Uday, for, for your participation and your thoughts. That's Thank a perfect that. segue. I okay. appreciate it. Thank you, Perry. Um, and I just, I feel like for just really quickly to put it back in a pediatric environmental health lens, having a pediatrician some or people who care about pediatric environmental health or experts in pediatric environmental health at the table and making some of those planning decisions is incredibly powerful. So I just want to bring it back to like we, those of us who are part of this conversation, have a real role to play there. I'm not, not an urban planner. I'm not uh, a, an economic development expert. I'm a pediatric environmental health person. And that voice around framing urban planning as a pediatric environmental health issue is really powerful. So I'll just leave you with that. I know we have to move on, but thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of the conversation.